Amen. And uh, yeah, amen. Just want to welcome everyone uh, online and in person today. And uh, anyway, today I want to talk about praying for Donald Trump. We, uh, you know, we have, we have a mandate in Scripture. Whether you like him or dislike him is regardless of the point. God calls us to pray for our president. God, Second, First Timothy chapter 2 talks about that explicitly. Pray for your leaders. Okay, It doesn't say if you like him or don't like him. Paul was talking about Nero when he wrote that. Okay, So you may hate Donald Trump. It does not exempt you from praying for him, God's will to be done. So what I want to do in this message today is talk about... Uh, Don, with Donald's Trump election, okay, whether you voted for him or didn't vote for him, I want to talk about the church fulfilling its mandate to pray for him. Okay, we've got a mandate to pray for him. If you're a Christian, if you have Christ in you, the scriptures say very clearly to pray for your president. So this message, I'm going to urge us, like Dad was talking about just now, I'm going to urge us in this message the need to pray for his protection. Because he is confronting, I mean, some very real enemies in our nation that absolutely must be confronted for this nation to become what God has intended this nation to be from the beginning. Because God has had, had his hand on this nation from the very beginning and, for, and that God would use Donald Trump to fulfill his purposes for this nation. So what I'm going to talk about today, if we're going to pray effectively for Donald Trump, We've got to recognize that God, we've got to recognize God's role in his appointment as president. Okay, the script, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but God has sovereignly appointed him to be president. Whether you like it or don't like it, you know, listen, also, if we're going to pray for him effectively, we've got to set aside our personal biases towards him. I'm going to explain this in more detail, but we also have to understand the mission God has for him. So what I want to do in this message, that's kind of where we're going in this message. What I want to do in this message is to kind of give you a little bit of background of I believe this is a prophetic message, but not, in the, not a prophetic message in the sense of predictive, like predict, I'm going to predict these things are going to happen over the next four years. It's more of a prophetic message of interpreting, so to speak, the handwriting on the wall. Because you remember Daniel. Daniel was prophetic. Daniel was predictive of these things are going to happen. These empires are going to rise. These empires are going to fall. These things are going to happen. He, he predicted what was going to happen to such a degree that scholars look at his writings and go, there's no way he wrote it when they say he wrote it because everything he wrote was so accurate. I mean, even to the point of time when he predicted when Jesus the Messiah would come and be crucified. It's a stunning prophecy, a stunning prophetic prophecy. Uh, minister that Daniel was, but Daniel was also interpretive. And that's where I'm getting at in this message. There is also in the prophetic, not just the need to predict, but the need also to interpret. See, when, when there was handwriting on the wall, Daniel interpreted that handwriting and said, this is what the Lord is saying through that event. And so that's where I'm coming from today is to offer more kind of like the sons of Issachar type thing of they understood the times and the seasons with knowledge about what Israel should do. We must have this element in the prophetic, not just the predictive element of these things are going to happen in the future, but also the element of interpreting the things that have just happened so that we can understand God's purposes in this. Okay, I just want to make one quick apology. I've got allergies really bad right now, so if I, my voice creaks, I'm not going through puberty. I have, <clears throat> I have allergies. In fact, we got mold, mold allergies that are really affecting me right now. I'm not sick, so if you think I'm sick, I'm not. But anyway, my, if my voice cracks or screeches, I'm not going through puberty. It's fighting off congestion. Okay, so that side note aside. Okay, back to the point. Is, is Daniel was anointed to interpret the signs of the times. The sons of Issachar understood the times and the seasons with knowledge of what Israel should do. The prophetic must have in it uh, the ability to interpret events with the understanding of God's purpose in this time and this season. I find in the church that there is very little discernment of, the, of discerning the times and the seasons we live in with knowledge of what God is saying for us to do. But we need that, and that's really the, that's really the um, 
perspective I'm coming through in this message is, is to interpret what has happened um, over the last few years and also in this election and what God's purpose is in this election so that we can have knowledge about what we need to do and how we need to respond to this election. Okay, so as I do this, just want to make a couple disclaimers. Well, as I do this, the way God has anointed me, called me, is either as a, both a prophetic role and a pastoral role. A prophetic role is, my prophetic role is, to, I want to discern the mind of Christ by the Spirit of God of what he's saying in this nation and to the church in this nation. And I want to speak that very boldly, what I believe God is speaking. Now, my other role that I have, um, I've got a teaching role too, but I'm saying as a pastor, I also realize, I just, you know, looking at the, the vote, and I realize how incredibly polarizing Donald Trump is, okay? Whether you love him or whether you hate him or whether you fall somewhere in between, he's extremely polarizing. And I realize 86% of the Christians, I think, voted for Trump in this election. That means 14% didn't. I realize there's probably people here, there's probably people online that listen to me that did not vote for Trump and are not overly excited that he has become president. So I'm realizing that. So I'm balancing this tension between this prophetic boldness of what I believe God's saying with also the realization that some, some of what I might be saying might be fingernails on a chalkboard to you, okay? I get it. I get it. It's not the easy balance here I'm trying to walk through, but I am sensitive to the fact that some people, you know, some Christians who love the Lord, who love our nation, cannot stand Donald Trump. So I get all that, okay? So I'm trying to walk in this balance here. <clears throat> One of the things we've got to do is we must, and I, you may have heard this term, but let me explain it. We must be aware of being in an echo chamber. I don't, have you ever heard that term? We're living in an echo chamber. Basically, what that means is the only voices that you are hearing are the ones you agree with. All of us, I am guilty of this. All of us are probably guilty of this where we where we align ourselves with the voices we agree with and don't hear the voices we disagree with, and it confirms our own biases in us. So we've got to always be aware of these echo chambers where we're aligning ourselves only with the voices that we agree with. I think it's very helpful, and that's why I love Twitter so much, not to mention Elon Musk's role of restoring free speech. That is amazing because if we lose free speech, we lose what this country's built on. Um, that you can get on Twitter and you can see different viewpoints and different perspectives. There's one guy I follow on Twitter. He is definitely chalk or fingernails on a chalkboard to me. He drives me crazy. But I listen to him. He's a, he's a, a Christian leader who loves God and he is devoted to prayer and he has a role to call out all this stuff and he drives me absolutely insane but I listen to him to find out, okay, where is my own personal bias blinding me so I can see, okay, let me understand that other perspective. <clears throat> and also, if, this is what I found as I've been, you know, writing and trying to teach on different theological topics, is if you really want to understand, you know, if you really want to understand an opposing viewpoint, You've got to be able to clearly articulate that viewpoint with empathy and understanding, realizing where the other perspective is coming from, okay? Otherwise, you're just, you're just going to get off on your talking points and just rail off and just speak this or that. So that's what I've learned in, in preaching and theology is I, if I want to, you know, listen, like for example, I do not believe in Calvinism, but if I want to understand what Calvinists teach, I've got to humbly you know, read what they teach so I can understand, okay, I see where you're coming from so I can point out where I disagree. The same is true in this election. You know, whatever side you are on in this election, we need to understand the other side and the other viewpoints either to refine our own selves or to bring change to our own selves and also to counteract the argument on the other side. Okay, so that said, that said, I want to call us to prayer. There is an urgent need like never before for the church to devote themselves to prayer for this nation and for this president. Let's turn right now to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul wrote to Timothy. 
Now, a little background as you're turning there, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. A little background to Timothy. When Paul wrote the book of 1 Timothy, he was writing to Timothy, who was the pastor of the church of Ephesus at that time. When he wrote, it was, scholars believe he wrote in like about eight, for somewhere between AD 60 to AD 64. It was during the reign of Nero. Now, if you know about Nero, Nero was instrumental in the absolute most, some of the most terrible persecutions of Christians in history. And, and Paul actually was saying, give thanks to your leaders. He's writing to Emperor ne writing about under the reign of Nero. Now, this is, scholars believe that when he's writing this, it's right before the great fire. I don't know if you ever heard about the great fire where Nero wanted to build, like, uh, start expanding on some building projects in the Roman Empire, and he realized he had to create a fire or to create some kind of chaos to establish his plan. So he, the rumor has it was he started a fire, and then he blamed the Christians for the fire, and it instituted incredible, incredible persecution in the Roman Empire, especially in the book of Rome, or in the city of Rome. And Paul was writing to Ephesus just right at the cusp of this persecution breaking out. It was before it was broken out. He was writing this prayer to the church of Ephesus, and I believe he something he, he may have known this or not known this, but he but the Lord was alerting the church of Ephesus to pray for their leadership because they knew persecution. The Spirit knew persecution was coming. Okay, you got to understand that. Okay, so Paul writes now in that context. First of all, I then urge. Hear the apostolic voice. Hear that apostolic voice. Paul's urging the church to pray for its leaders. And I just want to say, hear the urging of the Spirit of God to the American church, urging you to pray for your spiritual leaders, especially Donald Trump. That entreaties, that's, that's a, a prayer motivated by urgency, prayer, Petitions, that's intercession, supplication. And listen, you may not like this, and thanksgivings. <laughs> That'll go down really well to some. You're telling me I've got to be thankful for Donald Trump's election? I don't know. That's what it says, right? It's what it says. Now, if you can't find some things to be thankful for, you have personal bias against him because there are many things to be thankful for. He's, he's going against the transgender insanity. I don't know if you saw some of his executive orders. He's come out and he says the U.S. government is going to recognize that there are now only two genders, male and female. Okay, if you can't thank God for that, I mean, I don't know what scripture you're reading. <laughs> I mean, how can you not rejoice that now we don't have to worry about our government's going to get involved. We don't have to worry about perverted uh, uh, men going in, identifying as women, and using the women's restrooms. Can you not at least thank God for that? That now he's saying we don't have, we can get rid of this nonsense of he, the, the, them, that, that, all these pronoun nonsense. And you're like, I mean, part of when I was researching this message, trying to look into transgender, I mean, it's so confusing, like, you know, non-binary, I'm a non, I identify as a non-binary lizard who, whatever. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? Can you not thank God that he put in a president to confront this godlessness in our nation and to, and to put in an executive order that I am going to ban the government from allowing pharmaceutical companies to be part of a, a policy that will allow our young people to be mutilated and the government will recognize male and female. You've got to thank God for that. You might do a gritting your teeth, but we've got to thank God for that. One of his executive orders that came out, and I talked about this last Sunday, is that Donald Trump, one of his executive orders that came out Friday is he is going to absolutely resist, and I, I, I'll, I'll read it later, but he's going to resist the World Health Organization's pandemic treaty. He says, we are going to resist this treaty. We are not going to comply with that. 
So we can thank God, whether you like him or not, we can thank God that now we do not, if another pandemic happens, and if that would have been signed, there would have been another pandemic that would have happened, and it would not have been a coincidence, it would have been planned to bring the, the world under the control of the global government, and now we can praise God that now we don't have to worry about that we're going to be forced to take this vaccine against our wills. We're going to be forced to comply with digital ID that's going to track our vaccination schedules. Because you know what? That's leading us to the social credit system that is now in place in China, but now this would be a global one. That would be absolute hell on earth. We can thank God that God has raised up a president to resist this. There's so many things I could say, but I'm just saying Paul tells us to be thankful for our leaders, our presidents. Amen. Don't argue with me. Don't shoot the messenger. That's what Paul said. And he said it when, he, when Nero was in, off, was in rule, okay? Verse 2, for kings... And for all who are in authority, so that we may lead. Listen, this you're praying for Donald Trump. Listen to what it says. So that you may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. The church in Ephesus, this is speculation. We don't know how they responded to this, this apostolic command. But could it be, I'm just speculating, could it be because Paul told Timothy, get your people, get the church in Ephesus to pray. Could it be because the saints in Ephesus obeyed this commandment? Could it be that their prayers restrained the persecution from going from Rome into Ephesus, which is in Turkey? Perhaps their prayers and their intercession restrained that persecution from reaching them. Perhaps your prayers for Donald Trump is restraining persecution from coming to this nation because I believe with all my heart God has established this nation as a refuge from religious persecution. You're praying for Trump because so that we can lead a tranquil and a quiet life and all godliness and dignity. Okay, so now moving over we need to know, if we're going to pray for Donald Trump, we need to know three things. Number one, that, listen, God directly appointed him to be president. We may like it, love it, hate it, but God in his sovereignty made a choice to appoint him as president. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Number two, we must set aside personal biases against him if we're going to pray. You can't pray effectively for someone if you hate them. You can't pray effectively for someone that you think is Hitler. And he's not Hitler, by the way. That's just propaganda. You can't pray for someone if you don't understand the mission God has given him for this nation. Okay, let's, let's now, let's look at Scripture. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, of what the Word of God says about God's sovereignty in appointing leaders. Now, I realize there's some complexity to this that we won't get into today, but just we'll, we'll keep it relatively simple just for time's sake. But Daniel 2.21, uh, Daniel is writing, and he says, It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives, uh, let me just pause right there. God changes the times and the seasons. God changes kings and removes kings. God puts in presidents and takes pres presidents down. God is sovereign over governmental leaders. <clears throat> he gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. Some people might need, who are offended that Trump is president, might need to have a conversation with the Lord because God has divinely and sovereignly appointed him to be president. As I struggled big time when Biden was president. And I think you can look at his track record and his resume and see, okay, the fruit bore that out. But still, even though I was offended, I've got to realize God sovereignly put him in place. God sovereignly permitted Biden to be president 
from for four, the past four years to do a work in this nation. Whether I like it or don't like it, God does not ask my opinion what he's going to do. <laughs> the potter or the clay does not say to the potter, why have you done this? God in his sovereignty has the right to put whoever he wants into office as president, and he calls us to pray for them for God's will to be done. So, so Daniel says God is the one who changes the times and changes the seasons in his sovereignty. God is the one who puts in presidents and kings and removes them in his sovereignty. And then Daniel 4.17 says, The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. And he bestows on it whomever he wishes. Okay, listen to this. God bestows on it whomever he wishes. If he wishes for Joe Biden, he does it. If he wishes for Donald Trump, he does it. And it's up to us to discern, okay, God, why are you doing this in this season? And he says, he goes on to say, he sets over it the lowliest of men. Now, Donald Trump would not be characterized by the lowliest of men. He has an ego problem, okay? I'm not denying that. He is a full-blown, probably a narcissist. I'm not denying that, okay? He has a real ego problem, and we need to pray for him that God would humble, you know, I don't want to say God would really give him humility so that he could lead this nation humbly and not be divisive unnecessarily, okay? We've got to set aside our personal biases against him, whether we view him very, very negatively as Hitler or whether we think he's the next coming of the Messiah. E either way, we can't pray effectively. He has major character flaws. I am not denying that whatsoever. And I don't agree with his character flaws. But and we've got to understand God has a purpose for him and we must put aside our biases to pray without bias for God's will to be done for this human vessel flawed as he is. And I think, you know, he, he puts, um, like, like it says in Daniel 4, 17, he sets over it the lowliest of men. I think you could even apply this and say he sets over it people that you may not like, but it's what he wished. So we've got to pray. We've got to pray for the sovereign will of God to be done through this leader. Now, in this conversation about God's sovereignty, I do believe that there is a distinction between sovereign permission and divine appointment. Even though God in his sovereignty does this, there are some he permits to rule for a purpose and there are others who have been directly appointed him by him for a purpose. And I'll, my notes go into more detail about that. Listen, when God sovereignly appoints a person, it doesn't mean he approves of their character flaws. It doesn't mean he approves of everything they do or don't do. It means he's going to use them as a flawed human vessel, either for judgment or for justice or for restoration or for blessing. Romans 13 talks about that, the, that leaders are a minister of God for good and they are a minister of God for those who do evil to bring wrath. And, and, but there's also other purposes for the season we live in. In my opinion, you can agree with me, you can disagree with me, agree with me, it doesn't matter to me. In my opinion... The 2020 election, God permitted Joe Biden to be president, but didn't directly appoint him. And you can just look at the, his presidency. Listen, he's, the, to my opinion, the worst president in, the, in our history. I mean, just look at all the things he did. And I don't even know if he even realized he was doing half of them because he had dementia. I mean, when God puts a president or God permits someone with cognitive decline and then, full, you know, really moving into, into dementia to be president, God permits that. That's judgment on a nation. God was judging America over the last four years to refine our nation because, it, listen, it was not wrath, but it was a redemptive judgment to bring us to the, this place we're at right now to go into God's full purposes for this nation. It was a refining. I remember the, the lowest point of his presidency for me personally was, on, was in, uh, when they had like the Transgender Awareness Day. And there was, and this is what I had to like, like research. It was a transgender woman. I had to research this because I thought it was a, tra a transgender man. It was a transgender woman 
That is a, this is where it gets complicated, a biological man who transitioned to a woman, and he's on the White House lawn with breasts, sorry to make this, this kind of a little graphic, but not, not, not totally G-rated, breast implants with his shirt off on the White House lawn celebrating Transgender Day, and I'm like, oh, God, we have become so depraved. <clears throat> On the White House. I was like, God, I'll be honest with you, we are under judgment. You know, I, I, I didn't realize it, but I've been in some, some little mild depression over our, the state of our nation, probably even more than a mild depression, just grieved over where our nation has gone and the policies that we have enacted and all this, this terribleness. I mean, just, just, you know, it's so embarrassing just watching Biden on these, in these events, like walking the wrong way or having to be directed. It's like we, we have a president and all the leaders knew this who has dementia. The leaders, the world leaders, Putin, China, all these leaders knew that. It was so embarrassing. It was humiliating. It was God's sovereign permission to bring judgment on this nation. Thank God we're done with that. I don't know, I really don't know how a Christian cannot be happy that he's not in place anymore. I, I don't, I mean, to get rid of this transgender insanity, I, I mean, anyway. I want to say I believe Biden was sovereignly permitted, and I believe Trump was divinely appointed. There's a difference. Okay, that might offend some people, but I want you to think about this just real quick. Just think about this real quick. Go back to July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania. An assassin's bullet is headed right at Trump. In the very last second, he turns his head to the right or to the left. And by one inch, the bullet just uh, scrapes his ear. How can, I, how can anyone not say that was a miracle I mean, I don't know how a Christian can't look at that and go, that was an absolute miracle. God intervened on his life. He should have been dead, but the very last minute he turned this way by an inch, boom, he should have been dead. I don't see how Christians can't say that was a miracle, okay? And when I saw that, I was thinking, okay, Lord, you saved his life. I don't know if we're still under judgment. And if we were still under judgment, you would give us Kamala Harris to be president. But if that is what you're doing, I'm going to surrender to whatever your, your will is. But I know you protected his life. I thought deep down, perhaps God had a plan to put him back into president. I wasn't sure. But now that we know the election results... I think you can confidently say God protected his life because he had a plan for this nation and he had a plan to use Donald Trump in this nation for his purposes. I don't think that's debatable. I don't think that's debatable. I know Christians hate Trump and would debate that. I just don't see how you can't see. If God didn't want him to be president, he would have not allowed his life to be spared. He would not allow the, the nation to, to vote the way it did. <clears throat> anyway... I don't know. I just don't. Maybe you have such disdain for Trump that you, you are blinded to the miracle of God in saving his life. Anyway, I believe in summary that God saved his life because he didn't just permit Trump to be president, but appointed him to be president with a mission and a purpose for this nation. And we've got to pray into that mission and this purpose. Okay, I want to share a prophetic word concerning Donald Trump. And I know, listen, I am very much aware of the Trump prophecies out there. <laughs> and I'm very skeptical of most of them, okay? So I just want you to know that a lot of those, I'm just like, yeah. I'm aware of the quote-unquote MAGA prophets that are prophesying not by the inspiration of God, but by their own political biases and preferences, Okay. I get all of that, but I believe this is, I, I believe this truly is the word of the Lord for Donald Trump, okay? So you may agree with it, you may not agree with it, but at least I want you to take this back into prayer. Okay, when we, on, from July 12th through July 14th, Terry Bennett hosted a conference called the Eternal Gospel. 
And at this conference on July 13th, he had, um, the Lord spoke to him and said that we were to set apart bond servants who would preach the eternal gospel. And these bond servants would take a covenant level oath to preach Jesus Christ and his second coming uh, until the end without compromise. And, you know, he, he called, you know, Terry was prompted to call us individually, the, me and Michael, or me and uh, dad and Michael, um, to invite him to that, to, to, to join that uh, prayer. And he invited many others. So, the, you know, at the conference, there was, I don't know, however many people, 30 messengers who went down and said, okay, God has called me to do this. The marking of a bondservant to preach the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ in the end times. And it was very, very meaningful, very, very powerful. And the basic idea was like where Paul said, um, I am a bondservant for Jesus' sake, and I preach Christ and not myself. And that's really what we, we agreed to. We are preaching Christ and not ourselves. That, that's what we said. We are agreeing to preach Jesus Christ and not ourselves. Well, that very day is when, on the 13th, that night of the 13th was when he were, we prayed for the bond servants to be marked. Well, that, a couple hours before that, I get a text, I get all these text messages from Stephen, and he's like, did you see that Trump has been an uh, assassination attempt? And I start looking at it, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And all these images start coming out, and there's blood on his ear, or whatever, and I was like, wow, that is wild. The very day that we're being marked like this, and then Terry got up, and I, I wholeheartedly believe that what, what Terry said was the truth, is he got up in the conference and he said, if you notice, I can't remember exactly what he said, but you know, the whole thing was about God's bond servants. And he said, Exodus, I think he read out of Exodus 21, 5 through 6, but the bond servant but if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. And he shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl to be a servant for life. And it, I just, when I saw his bloodied right ear, I was like, God? And, and again, I was still not sure, okay, Lord, do you, are, are we still under judgment? Are we still, uh, Lord... Is, is Trump your man? I didn't know which way or not, but when I saw that, I was like, hmm, could it be that as God was anointing bond servants to preach Jesus Christ ordained in a prophetic way, could it be on that very same day that happened that perhaps this assassination attempt and it grazing his ear be a prophetic sign that God had marked Trump to be his political messenger? I believe so. You don't have to agree with me on that, okay? But I believe so. I believe God has appointed him in his sovereignty and marked him as a political messenger for this time. Okay. Now, let, let's turn to Romans chapter 13 because I want us to see in Romans chapter 13, in Romans chapter 13, God talks about the role of government and the need to be in divine order when it comes to government. And again, God doesn't ask our opinions. <laughs> we give them anyway, but God doesn't ask our opinions. But in verse 3, he's talking about, about the, the role of leaders he appoints in his sovereignty. And again, there's a, there's a lot we could talk about here. I'm not going to go into all the nuance and the debate and the complexity. I'm just going to be very simple here. In verse 3, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Um, let's just go down to verse 4. For basically saying for rulers are a minister, listen to this, rulers are a minister of God for your good. A minister of God. Now I think even when you see, even when you see the way God sovereignly protected Trump's life, and I believe, you can agree or disagree, marked him as a sign that he was a political messenger for this nation. He's a minister of God to you for good. Now, going down a little bit further, he says, it is a minister of God, a leader is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. I believe God has appointed Donald Trump in his sovereignty and spared his life to be a minister of God for good for this nation. 
to get this nation back to God's original intent for this nation in the end times so that we would not come under the reign and the dominion of globalism, which we were that close from have losing our sovereignty. We don't realize it. We are that close from losing our constitutional republic. We are that close to, to signing over our sovereignty to the UN and the WHO. Do, do the research. And God appointed him as a minister of God for good for this nation. And listen, God is going to use him to bring judgment and justice to the corruption in our government. If you have not researched the corruption in our government, it is utterly disgusting. It is absolutely dark and vile and filthy. I mean, it is, I can't even think of the words, is you know, if you just, all you do is listen to the propaganda machine of the mainstream media, you have no idea what is the corruption that is in the, this place of unelected bureaucrats who are running this country. You think, who's running this country now? Well, it's not Joe Biden. It's these bureaucrats, this deep state that some have called it. And the corruption that there is there is so absolutely disgusting. I believe, and Donald Trump has even said this in his executive orders, that he is coming against the deep state. Listen, if you think his life was in danger before, it's far more in danger right now. I mean, far, we don't even understand the, we don't even understand the power that these entities in our government have. But I believe with all my heart God has raised him up to get rid of the absolute corruption because you cannot have a country without justice and the rule of law. That God is raising him up as an instrument to bring justice to the corruption that has infiltrated our government. Because we can never, America can never be what it's meant to be in these end these times without the corruption being exposed and the corruption being brought to justice. We've got to have justice in this nation. So I want to say to us, we need to pray. We must pray for his protection. Listen, if he gets assassinated, there could be a real civil war in this nation. Okay, I'm warning you. I'm warning you of that. We must heed this call for prayer, for his protection. Buckle up. There's going to be a lot of exposure in the deep state of the American government. It's going to be nasty and ugly. I was reading on Twitter yesterday. And there's a guy I follow named Kevin Shipp. He's a former CIA officer who became a whistleblower of the CIA and began to expose the deep, deep corruption in the CIA. And the CIA targeted his life, he's a Christian, targeted his life and absolutely destroyed his life, ruined his life. And he tweeted out yesterday after Trump's executive orders to go against the deep state and the corruption in the intelligence agencies, he tweeted out, he said, I, have, I don't think I've, I haven't been this happy in a long, long time. I've been fighting for this for 14 years. That brought me to so much joy. I mean, I didn't have much joy yesterday as my dogs got crushed by Ole Miss, 28 to 10. But I tell you what, when I read his tweet, when I read his tweet that the, the joy that he has, he has, he's risked his life to expose the corruption in the CIA, and now we have a president that's going against that corruption to expose it. I was like almost brought to tears. I, I held myself and just made it be sweat. But <clears throat> I'm telling you, God is using him as an instrument of justice in this nation, and we need it. Listen, what has the word of the Lord been to us this whole year? Okay, if you get this wrong, you're going to be kicked out of the church, okay? What is the word of the Lord to us for this year? Divi always trust Judy to get the right answer. <laughs> Divine order. Okay, well, divine order isn't just for this small church. Divine order isn't just for the church. 
We're living in a time. This is where we got to understand. Listen, this is where we've. Got, this is where it's imperative to get rid of the propaganda and the voices that are coming against you. Understand the word of the Lord right now is divine order. Divine order in the church. Divine order in government. What does it mean when God brings divine order? He brings confrontation. He brings exposure. He brings light. He brings truth. It gets ugly. But through that process of bringing divine order, there's both judgment and justice. To the end, we have divine order, God's order in government. Listen, if you read our, the, the, our history, if you read the history of America, you see very, very clearly God's hand was in this founding of this nation. You know, some of our founders were definitely absolute devout Christians. Some were, were deist. But, you know, God was absolutely, his hand was involved in this nation. You can read the Constitution and go, what brilliance they had over almost 250 years ago. What brilliance they had. You can look at the first great awakening, God pouring out his spirit to get one nation under God. You can look at even the, the miraculous way the, the, the colonialists defeated the British in the Revolutionary War. God's hand was on that. You can look at how this nation, the, the Constitution, was inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying it's like near the Bible, but I'm not even close. But it's a secular document, but God's wisdom was in that constitution. God is now wanting to bring divine order into government based on the constitution. We are a constitutional republic. We are a constitutional republic. We are not a democracy. Our founding fathers established this nation as a constitutional republic based on the constitution. And I believe that God has raised up Donald Trump to, and we, listen, we have, we, have, we have almost virtually departed from the Constitution in many, many ways. And God wants to bring this back, this document to the very forefront of our government to say, unelected bureaucrats cannot rule this nation. That is out of God's divine order and what he established for government. And I believe that God is raising up Donald Trump to be that messenger to bring about God, a restoration in this nation. Donald Trump has a mandate, I believe, from God, and he has a mandate from this nation. He won in a landslide. There is a mandate from God on this. Now, we, got, we have got, listen, we have got to pray. Because, listen, I am not blinded to Trump's character flaws. He is prone to full-blown narcissism. He is, he is prone to be ex unnecessarily divisive. He's prone to be very vulgar. I don't approve of any of that. We've got to pray for him. We've got to pray for him that he would do God's will, and listen, and not his own will. If you're, if you're someone who is selfish and self-centered, and he is, we, God can still override that and use it for his purposes. We've got to pray for him. Now, this brings me to the second point. If we're going to intercede for Trump, we've got to set aside our personal biases. Whether you hate him or whether you idolize him, We've got to, listen, you cannot be an effective intercessor for him if you hate him and despise him and have disdain in your heart for him. And you cannot be an effective intercessor if you see he does no wrong. Both are, are absolutely false. Both are wrong. We've got to realize that if we're going to pray for him, we've got to pray God's will for him. See, I, I, I'm, I, again, I'm not going to even rehash. You, you know, I, like John Piper, he tweeted uh, like about four years ago, Trump is guilty of unrepentant sexual immorality. That's true. He's, repent, he's guilty of unrepent, unrepentant boastfulness. That's true. He's guilty of unrepentant vulgarity. That's true. 
He's, he's guilty of unrepentant divisiveness. That's true. I'm not denying any of that. So when we pray for him, we've got to pray that God would restrain those ungodly character flaws in him so that he can do the mission God's appointed him to do. However, even though I'm, I'm very concerned about his character flaws and sins, we did not elect a, a pastor. We elected a president. The, now, we, listen, you should know this. You should know this because we spent a lot of time on this. The biblical requirements to be an elder or to be a pastor are very high and very strict. They are not the same to be a president. That's why David, when he committed those sins of murder and adultery, God did not remove him from being king. Because the requirements for being a king or a president are different than being a pastor. If he was a pastor, he would have been removed from office. Because the requirements to be a pastor are very different than the requirements to be a president. We've got to understand that. Acts 13.36 says that David served God's purpose for his generation. I want to tell you God has a purpose for this generation. You know, how far we are into the time of the Lord's return, I don't know for sure. I mean, it seems like we're moving there faster and faster and faster. God has a unique purpose for this nation. And God, at this very time and season, that purpose, that window of opportunity has opened for this nation to move more and more into that purpose for his purposes at the end of the age. We've, listen, this is where I think Christians miss it. This is where I think Christians who are just so upset about what happened in this election miss it. This is where I think they miss it. They don't discern the purpose of God for this generation. They don't discern God's time and season for this hour. In this hour, the word of the Lord that God is bringing divine order into the church and into government. That means there's both judgment and justice. You can look at what's happened in the church over the last year to see that's absolutely the case. You can look, and I believe now we're moving in because God says judgment begins in the house of God first. What has happened over the past year? God's judgment has come to the church. It's still in the church. It's still moving in the church, but now God's moved to government. And he's, I believe now in this time and season, God's moving to bring judgment to the governmental leaders that are operating outside of the Constitution who have become enemies of this nation and what our founding fathers gave their lives for. God has raised up a mandate to bring divine order in this nation. I want you to understand this, I, okay? I want you to read Revelation 17, 16 through 17, if you get a chance. And we're going to read it now. Revelation 17, 16 through 17. God, at the end of the age, is going to use the Antichrist and the ten kings aligned with him to bring judgment on Babylon. Do you, know what the, the, do you know what heaven is going to be doing when they do that? They're going to be singing, Hallelujah! The great harlot who was corrupt in the earth has come down. You know what they're not going to be doing? They're not going to be looking at the character of the Antichrist and saying, God, how could you have done that? His character is so flawed. The ten kings, they're narcissists, they're evil, they're wicked. No, they understand that sometimes God uses, in this case, evil, wicked people, the Antichrist and the Ten Kings, to bring about his justice. Read it. They're not in heaven critiquing the character of the Antichrist and the Ten Kings, offended in a pious self-righteousness, saying, how dare you, God, to have used these people to bring judgment on the harlot Babylon. <clears throat> We've got to understand that. What does it say in that scripture? It says, God put it, listen to this, God put it into the heart of the Antichrist. God put it in the heart of the ten kings, his purpose. 
and they aligned with his purpose and did what God wanted them to do, and that was God's sovereignty at work. How absolutely beautiful is the wisdom of God to do that. So in this time and in this season, what if, and I believe this is true, what if God raised up a very flawed president who's a narcissist, who is, who is guilty of many, many unrepentant sins? What if God has put it in his heart? It doesn't matter if his motives are pure or not. It does not matter. What if the Antichrist and the Ten Kings, their motives were absolutely not pure? What if God has put it in his heart? God, what if God has put his purpose for this nation into Trump's heart? And he's going to use him to bring about the purposes for this nation. Whether Trump has pure motives or not, I doubt he probably does. But it doesn't matter. God is going to use him to bring justice and restoration to this nation and is for your protection of what's coming from the, the rising up of the Antichrist and this, this one world government. Amen. America is meant to be called a resistor of global government and not to align with the Antichrist nations. And we were one inch away from going into the Antichrist government. Yeah. Praise God for his deliverance. Yeah. I'm like one of those TV, I need like a like a handkerchief to wipe my sweat off. <laughs> I need a piano to play for me here, you know. Da -da -da. Um, God's purpose for America at this time is divine order through judgment and justice. Listen to this, this might offend you. I've already probably offended you 20 times, but <clears throat> Donald Trump is the absolute perfect person for this role. Winston Churchill, because of his warrior spirit, was the absolute perfect prime minister for the UK during World War II. He had, I mean, you look at what happened with Chamberlain and Winston Churchill. Chamberlain was a pacifist. He made agreements with Hitler. Churchill said, absolutely not. I love Churchill. Is it, we're going to fight. We're going to fight through blood, sweat, and tears. We are going to fight until we get the victory. I love his speeches, and it's so inspirational. God raised up Churchill for that moment for the UK to fight the Nazi regime of Hitler. But you know what? Churchill was a lousy person in peacetime. That's why he didn't get elected after the war. I'm telling you, whether you like Donald Trump or not, he is the perfect choice for this time in America to accomplish the deep work that must be done of restoration. America and what has happened by the infiltration of Marxist and communist and globalist and all kinds of evil entities into the deeper inner workings of our government. Listen, we have been taken over in a sense, we, most, most Americans don't even realize this. Most, most, most Christians, most Americans don't even realize that we have been taken over by, by influences, globalist, Marxist, communist. Just do the research. If you want to ask me about that, I'll be glad to give you the, uh, the information. And God has raised him up to get this nation back. Okay, listen, if we are going to pray, if we're going to pray for him, we've got to get rid of our personal biases. Again, I've talked about Trump desperately needs humility. We need to pray for him to have humility. We need to pray for him that he would not be divisive unnecessarily. There are places where he needs to be divisive, but unnecessarily divisive, where it's not profitable. We need to pray this, that, there, that even in this there, there are times when he might need to show some restraint. We need to pray for that. But I'm just going to tell you, listen, th listen, th we've got to approach him, I believe, with all my heart, with nuance. If you look at it through a black and white lens, you're going you're to miss it one way or the other. 
If you look at it through a black and white lens of this polarized view, you're going to miss it one way or the, another. Listen, I personally, yes, I am, if you come up to me and say, well, what about this, what about that? I'm probably going to most of the time agree with you, yeah, I can't defend his pride. I can't defend his sexual sins. I can't defend his vulgar language. I can't defend any of those things. But here's what I love about Trump. He's real and he's authentic. Here's what I probably love about him the most. He has a deep love for the country that I hold dear. That's probably the number one thing for me for against, for him, that I love about him. He loves this country. He wants this country to be what it's meant to be. Here's what I love about him. At 78 years old, as a billionaire, he could just retire and enjoy his life, but he's putting his entire life and family at risk to sacrifice for the country he loves. Here's what I love about him. He's not a political puppet controlled by donor interests. Thank God for that, because so much of what happens is they are just merely puppets controlled by their donor's interests. Listen, he's resilient. Listen, if you're a Christian, you should look at him and say, I need some of that resilience in my own life. Two assassination attempts, overcoming the weaponization of the Justice, Justice Department against him by his political adversaries, defeating the, the media's propaganda war against him. Listen, some of you must get off mainstream media. It's absolutely propaganda. He kept fighting when the deep state did everything in their power to take him out. He just had the greatest political comeback in history. He prevailed against the media, the, the, the deep state, the uniparty, the rhinos, Republicans in name only, the radical left, the globalists, the Marxists, and the communists in China. This is what I love about him. After his first assassination attempt, I, I, I personally don't believe he's a Christian yet. I'm hopeful, praying. But there's definitely a new tenderness and openness in his heart to God. He, he, listen, he realizes God protected me. I think he realizes that Jesus Christ is, is God. I do, because he, just the way he favors Christians in his administration. I love the fact that Christians lay hands on him. He allows Christians to lay hands on him and pray for him. He's not like Kamala when someone said, Jesus is Lord. He says, you're at the wrong rally. He allows Christians to lay hands on him and pray for him. I love that he wants, listen, if, if you, if, if, whether you stand on Donald Trump, listen, he wants to protect American Christians from government persecution. There may be nothing else you like about him. Thank God if you're a true born-again Christian, thank the Lord that he put someone in place that would help to restrain state-sponsored persecution against Christians. Well, that can never come in our nation. Oh, you bet. Listen, we were very close to that happening. And still could be. If, if it, we gotta, That's why we got to pray. He wants to take America out of the hands of the political elite and give it back to the people as our founding fathers intended, of the people, for the people, by the people. You are meant to be a, you are meant to, in this country, to, to be your nation, not ruled by the political elite, but those who you elect as your representative. I'm thankful because Donald Trump is taking a bold stand against trans insanity in this nation. Thank God for that. Thank God that he said, I am going to take a bold stand and make the government recognize there are two genders. There's not, you know, sometimes you sign up for these things, what's your gender? And it's like, what the heck does even this stuff mean? Like, I don't even know, I can't even think of the top of my head, but like he, him, they, binary, non-binary, whatever. It's just like, what? <laughs> I mean, you could like ask a kindergartner, what are the two genders? And they would easily say male and female. And yet now we've got all, like, whatever, however many genders there are. Donald Trump is saying we're going to get the government to stand behind it, that there, are, there is male and female, and that's the only thing we're recognizing. I am so thankful for that. I'm so, so thankful we can get Rachel Levine out of the health, have you ever, you know, have you seen that transgender woman, out of the Health and Human Service Department and put in Robert Kennedy Jr.? I mean, thank God for that. Thank God we're getting that nonsense out of that, of that department. <sighs> 
thank God that Donald Trump was instrumental in the overturning of Roe versus Wade. I don't agree with his, like, I don't agree with some of his abortion changes of late. I, I wish it would be a federal law that would prohibit abortion, but it's not there yet. But I'm going to take the small victories we can get. Overturning Roe versus Wade was huge. Now it's brought back down to the states for them to decide. And it, that's which really the way our, our founding fathers intended for ha to happen. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the victories there. I'm thankful that Donald Trump hates the globalist movement just as much or more than I do, because I hate it. I know where it's leading. It's leading to the rule and the reign of the Antichrist for three and a half years. I've studied eschatology for so many years and just the horrors of the, the one world government. And Donald Trump was, Donald Trump is resisting that movement. That rising up of that Antichrist kingdom, which it has never been stronger in our history. And he said, we are not going to align ourselves with the UN and the World Health Organization and the World Economic Forum. We are going to resist global government. Listen, that is a huge breakthrough. If America came under that control, your lives would be totally different and persecution of, Christian, of true Christianity would spread through this nation. He's resisting global government. Here's my point. We've got to pray for him. We have got to pray for him. It is for the good of your children, your grandchildren, even back to our founding fathers. I, I just have this feeling our founding fathers and all who have shed their blood to preserve this constitutional republic that this nation was built on or looking down from heaven, those who had put their faith in Jesus Christ, looking down upon us and saying, how will you Americans preserve the republic that we shed our blood for, that we risked our lives for? How will you respond? Will you pray at this opportune time like you've never prayed before, like you've never interceded before? Will you commission heaven and ask God to use Trump flawed as he is, to use him as a minister of good for the American people, as a minister of evil against the injustices in this nation who have gone against the Constitution and become an enemy of America as intended by our founding fathers. Would you pray for his protection so that his, all of his enemies, would, would he would be protected from all of those enemies? Assassination attempts that we don't even know how could even happen. There are so many weapons out there, we have no idea how those could even we have no idea what's even out there. There are so many sophisticated ways to take him out. We must pray for him because he, his life was already at risk. His life is much more at risk right now, especially with this bold agenda he has. Will you pray for him because it is for your good, your peace, your protection, and for the protection of your children and your grandchildren? Stand in the gap like Esther. Who knows if you were not born for such a time as this. To intercede like Esther on behalf of the king and to say, spare your people, spare this nation, spare this republic upon which our founding fathers laid their lives down and which God had his hand in to establish this government. Pray and intercede for him for all that God wants to do. And that he would not allow his pride, his arrogance, his tendency to push too far, to lead him astray from the mandate God is giving him. Because he can, listen, he can miss it. He can miss it by going far, way too far to the right. We must pray that he stays on track of what God wants him to do. And he does, he accomplishes God's purpose with God's wisdom. We've got to pray. Listen, we are at war. I hope you realize this. We've been at war. A lot of, a lot, a lot of Christians don't have a clue of the war we are in. We are, we've been at war in this nation. 
And that, the war is just basically over, will America align with the coming Antichrist kingdom that's rising up out of Europe, the UN, the World Economic Forum, the WHO? Or will America be the constitutional republic that God intended when, and when he founded this nation many, many years ago? We are at war. We are in a time of, of prayer, wartime prayer. We must pray for Donald Trump. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, we come to you. We just tell you we love you. Lord, we are grateful for you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you, Father. We just thank you for the deliverance you accomplished, Lord. And we just pray, God, for the protection, Lord, of Donald Trump, that you would protect him. You would be a shield about him, Lord. You would protect his family, we pray. And we just ask you for that, Lord. And that we pray that we would rise to the challenge, Lord, to the call to prayer and intercession. And Lord, we pray that we would rise to the challenge of this in Jesus' name. And God, that we would be faithful to pray in Jesus' name. Help us as a church in America to be faithful to intercede. In this time and this hour, we cry out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we can.